Hi, and welcome back to part two of our podcast on the Portuguese Revolution of 1974 to 75. If you haven't listened to part one, I'd go back and listen to that first. Amigo, maior que o pensamento, por essa estrada a mil vai. As we touched on last time, there were a lot of different political organizations involved in the revolution to some extent. So we asked Phil Mailer, author of Portugal, The Impossible Revolution, who took part in the events, to give us a quick rundown of the most important ones. Basically, the split in Portuguese society was many folds. I mean, it was uh, uh, the old the old right and the fascists were still there. Even if they weren't in the country, they, they still had money. They could still produce newspapers and leaflets. And then there would be the extreme right, uh, people who, like the, from the CDS, uh, the Christian Democratic uh, Socialists, I mean, they just hated the communists. And then towards the middle, you had the uh, popular Democrats, they used to be called the popular Democrats, became the social Democrats, and the Socialist Party. And so you had a right wing, you had the middle, and the Socialist Party and the Social Democrats wanted parliamentary democracy and they wanted to be European. Then you would have the Communist Party. Now, the Communist Party moved to the left, sometimes moved to the Socialist Party, sometimes it was uh, hovering, but they were very coherent about what it was they wanted. Sometimes they would use the extreme left, uh, which would be the Maoists and all the Trotskyists, and the, the, mainly the Maoists. There were mainly Maoist groups. The anarchists, unfortunately, were almost non-existent because they had been destroyed after the 1934 uprising. But the Communist Party was in control of the trade union movement and they certainly controlled the streets in terms of demonstrations and they would use the extreme left when they when it was necessary and they would use the socialist party uh, when it was necessary but they said they didn't really uh, i mean the main enemy was the socialist party the main competition would have been between the socialist party and the communist party the Right wing, there were elements of the CIA involved in Portuguese society at this time. There were uh, right wing fascist groups from Spain. The U.S. Embassy was was very uh, quite active. Carlucci, who was the uh, um, ambassador, was very active. He had been a CIA agent, and he was very very active in in uh, on events. Around, around the side. It was a very, very divided society. An important thing to bear in mind here, especially for younger listeners, is that the 1970s were during the Cold War. The Soviet Union very much still existed and was considered an existential threat for the West. And Portugal opting for a Soviet-style state-run economy was something which many people thought was a definite possibility, which was very much feared by employers and Western bloc governments. Maoists are followers of the ideology of Chinese communist leader Mao Zedong. The most significant Maoist group in Portugal at the time was the Movement for the Reorganisation of the Party of the Proletariat, MRPP, although it wasn't officially recognised by China. The official Maoist group recognised by China was the somewhat confusingly named Portuguese Communist Party Brackets Marxist Leninist Close Brackets, which wasn't as influential. Anyway, we'll come back to them later. Going back to the official Communist Party linked to Moscow, Raquel Varela, author of A People's History of the Portuguese Revolution and a forthcoming book on the CP during the revolution, explains their strategy. And unlike what you may assume from the name, it was not to make Portugal communist. We came to the conclusion is that the Communist Party, they didn't want a revolution. They wanted to control the state apparatus, insert it in the forces of the Cold War. So as Stalin, Roosevelt and Churchill have negotiated in the Alta in Potsdam in the end of Second World War in 1945, that Portugal was part of the American sphere. Angola was not, Mozambique was not, Guinea was not. So this was a place where they could fight for influence, both China, US and uh, USSR. But Portugal 
should be part of NATO, should be part of capitalism. So the Communist Party here did whatever they could, I'm underlying this, to stop the revolution, to stop the uh, self-organization of the workers. So, for example, I've made a full investigation of strikes, which are dozens and of strikes, in fact, hundreds of strikes just at the beginning of the revolution, and the Communist Party is against all these strikes, and not just against theoretically. They send their militants to the factories to say that strikes uh, should not be done. They should support the Front Popular Government because the Communist Party was with the government with right-wing and social democrats. So a typical popular front situation, like in France in '36, or a, let's say later on a situation like the government of Kerensky in Russian Revolution, if we want to make some kind of analogy. And this was, it's very interesting to understand that the May of 68 has stopped the Stalinist hegemony uh, in workers in Europe. But the Portuguese revolution went even far away. So uh, the, the, the attitude of the Communist Party against the strikes and the workers led to a huge influence of the so-called extreme left or radical left, mainly Maoists, Gevarists, and Catholic progressist uh, self-management Catholics and Trotskyists in a small proportion. So this is the role of the Communist Party. They wanted a regulated capitalism. So they defended labor rights, they defended some nationalizations, but they were against any uh, self-emancipation that could lead to taking the power of the state by the workers. In fact, they obliterate, they, they did whatever they could to stop this. The price they had to pay for this was that uh, this had led to a development of extreme left very strong, which lastly until 86, 85 in Portugal. Briefly, just to explain a couple of the terms there, Guevarists are ideological followers of Che Guevara, a central figure in the Cuban Revolution, who had a heavy focus on armed struggle. Trotskyists are followers of Russian Bolshevik leader Leon Trotsky, who fell out with the party leadership under Joseph Stalin. Communist Party strategy was also for Portugal to respect all of its existing international agreements and treaties, including its membership at NATO, and instead the Soviet Union would seek to bring Angola into its sphere of influence. On the other end of the political spectrum, capitalist governments everywhere were watching events in Portugal closely, with a great deal of concern. The term Raquel mentions in the next clip, neoliberalism, essentially refers to free market economic reforms, Things like privatization, reduction of social spending, and so on. What we realize after the opening of archives of Germany and US is that, first of all, after Vietnam, Portugal was the main concern of US foreign policy and German foreign policy. The first concern was Portugal. The idea is that they had to stop the Portuguese revolution to avoid the contagious to Spanish because of the influence of the Portuguese Revolution, the end of Francoist regime and the end of the dictatorship of coronels in Greece. So they, they, Gerald Ford, the president of the U.S., was afraid of, in his words, a red Mediterranean. Uh, so what we saw, for example, in my opinion, I've developed this in the People's History of the Revolution, although it's a contrafactual uh, idea, I believe that the Portuguese revolution was the beginning of a revolutionary process in Southern Europe that uh, uh, was um, made a pressure over the governments of Northern Europe to postpone neoliberal policies until the 80s crisis. So just not was not after the 70 crisis, but after the 80 crisis that the anti-cyclical measures of neoliberalism were st- were they had a way to impose. Uh, in the 70s, the Portuguese revolution had, met, had such a radical influence that they could not handle in a process of a revolutionary Portugal as it was seen at the time, so radical, so giving so much hope to the countries, to the people of Europe, to threat, to, to dare, to close the mines or... Uh, destroy the traditional unions as they have done in the 80s. 
in fact, they have done in the 80s, because not because it was a crisis, but because there was not a political answer. Uh, there was not a revolution in the 80s. That's why capitalists were strong enough to develop neoliberal policies. So and what we saw was that the biggest amount of money ever given from Germany to a country, from a social democratic party, was to socialists in Portugal to avoid the revolution. Now this is open, the archives. And this money was coming, uh, it is supposed, from U.S. But in fact, U.S. put it here, Carlucci, Franco Carlucci, as the man who should avoid the revolution. They developed here, the U.S., a notion of counter-revolution that was after applied in Spain and in Latin America in the 80s, was the idea that you shouldn't stop a revolution by a bloody coup d'etat like they have done in Chile. They, here, they were not strong enough to do this. You should stop a revolution by uh, doing elections and, uh, let's say, a democratic reaction, a democratic counter-revolution. You should support yourself in left uh, reformist parties and in an elections process that could avoid the development of self-organized Soviets or commissions or councils, workers' councils. Back in Portugal, after the initial military coup, the movement of the armed forces, MFA, set up the first provisional government, including all the major parties from the Conservatives to the Socialist Party and the Communist Party. And being given power within the capitalist state had a significant impact on how the Communist Party would act. The Communist Party in the old days, you know, had been so brave from the day who the only people who came into the 25th of April with a clean slate. So many of them had gone to prison, were, were tortured, and they were listened to. But when the Communist Party started to join the first government, it came out against certain strikes. Like, for example, it came out against the airline strike, uh, the tap worker strike, saying that it was that it was reactionary, when in fact it wasn't. So yeah, it was. Uh, there were certainly heady times, and uh, quite fascinating. A lot was going on at the level of the government in the Portuguese Revolution. In total, there were six provisional governments and at least four military coups. We're not going to cover all of this in a lot of detail, because what's more interesting and important to us is what's going on at the grassroots among the working class itself. In part one, we spoke about worker struggles quite briefly. Now we're going to go into them in a bit more detail. This is simplifying a bit, but you could generally divide the kind of workplace struggles that took place in the Portuguese Revolution into two broad categories. One being workers fighting for particular demands like pay increases and saneamento, that's the removal of fascists and their informers using strikes and occupations. The other one being workplace takeovers. The Portuguese Revolution also didn't take place in a vacuum. It broke out during a global recession which began in 1973 following the collapse of the Bretton Woods monetary system, which was a series of monetary policies adopted by most Western powers towards the end of World War II. This resulted in a large number of Portuguese capitalists either deciding to sharp shop or make layoffs. In many such enterprises, workers decided to take them over and self-manage them collectively. But the new self-managed enterprises would then have to contend with the same problems with the global capitalist marketplace as their previous owners. Um, the problem with that is that they didn't know how to manage. I mean, there weren't managers, there were workers. And obviously they couldn't export because people at the other end, people in Europe, wouldn't deal with uh, a workers' committee. So it led to an awful lot of problems. Some well-known retailers like Marks & Spencer in Britain stop purchasing from their Portuguese suppliers, which had been taken over by the workers. First of all, finding a place to meet where, which suits everybody. You know, the difference between men and women, for example, is a huge factor. The political party nature of some of the discussions and people, people attacking each other on political lines. I mean, the Maoists were notorious in this, but the Communist Party was, was pretty bad as well. Raquel thinks it's important to distinguish between these instances of workers' self-management of capitalist enterprises, with movements at the same time for workers' control, which she believes is qualitatively different. What we had in Portugal was, in my opinion, two phenomena that, that should be theoretically distinguished because they are different from the empirical point of view and political point of view. We saw that the companies that were um, abandoned or decapitalized by the capitalists 
after the revolution or even after the crisis of the 70s and the end of Bretton Woods. So the immobilization of productive capitals by the companies led to them to the collective dismissals. And workers went there to occupy these companies and start self-management of these companies. And we are speaking about over 600 companies during two years of revolution were occupied in self-management process. So it's one of the biggest, if not the biggest in humanity. I cannot say it's the biggest because we have to think of Biennio Rosso in Italy in 1920 or even in Popular Front in France in 36. But there are not much examples where you can see 600 companies occupied by the workers in one country some of them uh, with links to international capital. But these companies were, from the capitalist point of view, being decapitalized. So, uh, for example, the Social Democrats were in favor of this. The problem is that these companies, workers learn how to take care of themselves, and we have wonderful testimonies that I tried to put in the book about this. But the companies were, from the economic point of view, in rupture. What we saw, which is much more radical from the socialist point of view, is workers' control. Workers' control is not self-management. They were not managed by the workers. So we are speaking of big companies uh, in Portugal that they were not in rupture. They They were in process of accumulation. And workers decide to control For example, the wages, saying the management could just earn 12 times more than the average worker. The management could not earn 12 times more than a worker, saying that uh, uh, they want to open the contability of the companies and control the contability of the companies, and saying directly, we don't want to become bosses of ourselves, we don't want to be capitalists, we want to be organized in this company to take state power. This is workers' control, which is much more similar to, for example, the Russian Revolution than to the process of self-management. Now, while other writers and groups in the past have used different definitions of terms like workers' control and workers' self-management, which can confuse things a bit, this is a really important distinction, because the Portuguese experience showed that capitalism can coexist quite happily with workers' self-management. So the Portuguese government decided to recognise most of the new self-managed enterprises in order to recuperate them into official state channels. Then in the self-managed enterprises, to some extent it's just then the workers' commissions or other democratic bodies which have to agree to lower wages or increase hours to keep the enterprises profitable rather than the boss. Now that's not to say that workers in these cooperatives were happy to just go along with whatever the market dictated. In many cases in Portugal during the revolution, they fought and demanded that loss-making enterprises be nationalised and subsidised by the state. Jorge Valadas, a military deserter who returned to Portugal during the revolution, explained a bit more looking at the example of agricultural collectives, which were originally seized sometimes by armed groups of workers, and how they were recuperated by the state. There was a big net, uh, quite an important network of cooperatives and self-managed small factories and less small and, and land occupations. It's difficult to summarize that in few words. In the, the countryside, the land question, the experience of the cooperatives in, in the Portuguese Revolution is very important because it concerned half, practically half of the country, and it was an enormous sector. But that sector was very fast controlled by the Communist Party through the state because this cooperative movement, and that, that's part of all this discussion about, about cooperatives and, and nowadays there is all this discussion about commons. So about all, all this sector to develop and to, defu- to function, they need to have credits because they, didn't, they were still functioning inside of a market system. And so the credits were done through, were given through the state and through the Minister of the Agriculture, which was controlled by the Communist Party. And the, these credits were done in exchange of specialists. We, we bring here another aspect of this question, which goes back to the Russian Revolution. One aspect, which is this aspect of the role of the specialists. I mean, 
the role of the specialist is very important in a, a movement like that because first the idea that you need to have specialists is in a way true but not but in another way is a danger because a specialist if it has the power connect with this specialization it becomes i mean it becomes a, a an authoritarian structure inside of your experience and uh, so the the in this uh, agricultural a system, the specialists that came with the credits, with the money, were agrarian specialists, and they often had a role, became more and more important inside of these occupations of land, and they became a part, sort of, director apparatus. So that that was one aspect of that. So the, the, the first aspect of that is the fact that, which brings us to the today question, you can develop all these cooperatives, all these commons, but if, you don't, if they don't develop, if they don't create by themselves a new form of reorganization of society, if they still function inside of the same market framework, monetary framework, they are bound to be destroyed or, or recuperated very fast. As more time passed, a number of issues started to emerge within the workplace struggles. At this time, I met up with a group of open revolutionaries. A lot of people became Maoists. They started joining political parties and they would take that political party stuff into the plenary sessions. And you could tell exactly who was who uh, from the, the language they were using. I mean, an awful lot of the workers wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't use that language. They, they just wanted to, uh, you know, they wanted to get on with the business of cleansing the fascists, of uh, getting better wages, and having a reorganization. Efforts to bring different workers' commissions together to coordinate were also hampered by squabbles between left groups, as each major left wing organization tried to start up its own network of commissions, which was under its own control. The MRPP had had its own organization. They didn't say it was the MRPP, but they called it inter-empresas, inter-companies. And uh, the PRP the, uh, had the Workers' Councils movement. There were attempts to set up an organization throughout society which could band together in a non-party way but they ended up being manipulated by uh, political parties, both the interpreters by the MRPP and the workers' councils by the PRPP, the favorite group of the International Socialist Group. The PRP were a Guevarist group, and the International Socialists were a British Trotskyist group, who later rebranded themselves as the Socialist Workers' Party, which most British lefties will have come across in one way or another. Anyway, they sent over some of their supporters to get involved. They in turn sent out thousands, filled up Ryanair planes with uh, revolutionary tourists uh, <laughs> to, to visit. And it was, a, it was a bit of a mess. These revolutionary tourists were, were actually negative on the whole. A lot of them were very good and they came to help, but a lot of them just got in the way. Revolutionary tourists also contributed to some problems within rural collectives, as there were cultural clashes between their liberal attitudes towards things like sex and those of the locals, which were more small-c conservative after decades of dictatorship and repression. And this caused some problems and resentments, for example when foreigners started sleeping with local people. While members of the far-left groups played important roles in the strikes and in workers' commissions, Phil believes the inter-party rivalries had a negative effect especially as they sometimes descended into violence. For example, between the Maoist MRPP and the Communist Party, whom the Maoists considered were, quote, social fascists. As a minor detour for any lefty history nerds, this is quite an ironic position, given that during the rise of fascism in the 1920s, the official position of Communist parties were that the Social Democrats were social fascists, and to be considered as much the enemy as actual fascists. The MRPP, the main Maoist groups led by Arnaldo Matz, was a very strange, very, very strange group. Their worst enemy was the Communist Party, and they were worse than, than the right wing. 
they were a pain in the ass. I mean, they produced huge, these huge murals and uh, very colorful painting, wall paintings. But on the other hand, they were, and they were very active in the workers' committees, but they were uh, really um, a divisive force. They actually attacked demonstrations and, and they, were, they were quite vicious. Many workers and neighbourhood commissions tried to put an end to the party political infighting. Uh, one of the problems was the political parties. If you had a demonstration for housing, certain groups started to bring out their own banners, you know, like their Maoist banners or the Communist Party banner. And people said, no, no, this is not, uh, this is not your demonstration, this is a general demonstration. Party banners were actually prohibited at demonstrations. A general movement was, was very unique, I, uh, I think. Elsewhere, there was a left-wing backlash against the surge of feminist activism. This culminated in an appalling incident during a protest by the Movement for the Liberation of Women, MLM, a group Phil mentioned in part one. But this manifesto, proposed demonstration, was publicised in the most trivial forms in the newspapers. Um, a Capital, for example, an evening newspaper, uh, which is usually a serious newspaper, treated the whole thing as a joke. It was announced as a sort of bra-burning uh, episode. And like all the new other newspapers, it promised a striptease. Um, the MDM, the movement, Democratic Movement of Women, which was uh, the PCP organization, violently denounced the demonstration instead of supporting it. And crowds of men turned up and began to boo. They jeered and taunted the women. And the, the women had to, and only, they had to really basically escape from there. This was a typical Communist Party and leftist thinking. Instead of treating women as individuals, they were basically treating them as an adjunct to the family and, and looked at its import, their importance through that. The uh, repression of that demonstration put the women's movement back uh, right at the beginning and was never ever to uh, come uh, out again in, in any kind of real sense. There was no real women's movement, even through the, uh, the rest of the, uh, the time of the rest of the revolution. Women were part of the general factory struggles and uh, never developed an agenda on the, of their own. That horrific incident aside, there were many practical examples of solidarity between men and women in the working class as a whole including many strikes for equal pay, some undertaken by mostly male groups of workers, for example, metal workers. As the revolution progressed, divisions also opened up within the military. But the main controlling elements were the army. Now, there were three factions in the army. There was the right-wing uh, faction, and they really didn't, they had lost out, uh, which, there, there was Spinola and, and uh, the, the General Spinola and, uh, and others, but they had lost out after two unsuccessful coups uh, on the 28th of September, 74, and then on the 11th of March, uh, 75. And a lot of these guys had, had escaped to Brazil or to Europe somewhere. So the main group, uh, there were the two main groups in the army, uh, controlling factions of the army that were left were the so-called group of nine. And they had, they had quite a bit of power um, in the army. And then the other section was Copcon, and, which was controlled by the far left. The two attempted military coups were by right-wing factions in the army. And they were defeated by a combination of swift action by the working class as well as left factions of the army. The Group of Nine was a moderate social democratic grouping, broadly aligned with the ideology of the Socialist Party. As well as the military, divisions in the general population also grew, creating a potentially explosive situation. And when the right wing started moving in the summer of 75, and they started burning down Communist Party headquarters, and there was a real danger of that it could break into a civil war. 
there was the commune of Lisbon and the south. But in the north, it was uh, the Catholic Church was still very, very strong. A lot of right-wing Catholic priests were very afraid of communism and uh, came out preaching uh, against communism. And the people, they got afraid and they started to burn down commun Communist Party uh, headquarters. So it was a dangerous situation. Also, the left, the, the far left, infiltrated large sections of the military. And there was a real danger that these two sides could come to blows. One factor which really strengthened the counter-revolutionary reaction was the return to Portugal of large numbers of disgruntled colonists. Now, when the colonies collapsed, something like half a million people from Angola and Mozambique returned to Portugal. There was nowhere for them to stay. They were uh, put up in hotels, they occupied hotels, and they were camped in parks, and they were all over the place, all over Portugal. And these were, as you can imagine, quite bit embittered Portuguese poor people and extremely right-wing. And this was part of that summer of, uh, of 75, the, the, when the right-wing started bombing the Communist Party headquarters and that the Socialist Party headquarters, some were attacked as well. It was a huge problem. One of the really largest problems was where to where to put them up. I mean, there was nowhere you you couldn't you can't have a you know a city of a million and a half people suddenly gets an extra half a million people. It creates all sorts of problems, and it created an awful lot of bitterness. As another example of how deep the divisions in the left were, some of the Maoist groups actually even supported the terrorist attacks against the Communist Party. Throughout the revolutionary events, the state was walking on a bit of a tightrope. Those within the MFA generally wanted to be on the side of the people, so they were reluctant to use a lot of military repression. Instead, their tactic was generally to grant concessions, including major ones. So as one example, after bank workers occupied the banks in March 1975, demanding they be nationalised, the following day they were. And in general, the state would give approval to land and workplace takeovers, which workers had done themselves. On one level, this was meaningless, because workers had already created the new situation. But the state formally acknowledging them did bring these radical acts, which had challenged the institution of private property, back into the realms of legal channels. And it instilled the confidence of the workers in the institution of the state. Meanwhile, state violence would only be used sparingly, when, as the state saw it, workers tried to go too far. And in many cases, the left-wing force of the MFA, COPCON, would even be used to protect workers taking action. So in general, it had a lot of support amongst the working class. And that was very, very difficult to criticise in the daily life social movements because people didn't feel they had strength enough to go further and they always asked the help to the democratic army to come and help them if they let's say, take a factory or take a, a land, and they didn't really trust in themselves, so they asked the help of the army. And with the help of the army came the state, came these political parties, and came a recuperation of the movement. The fact that revolutionary left groups had a fair amount of influence within COPCON, combined with the general light touch of the MFA on the working class movement, meant that there were comparatively few efforts made to develop autonomous rank and file organisation in the army or for the working class to arm itself. There were some minor exceptions to the latter, like the armed land occupation spoken about in part one, and some of the Guevara's groups did amass some small arms. In terms of rank and file organization within the army, attempts to do this did begin at a late stage in September 1975. At this time, Portugal was on its fifth provisional government, and this one had a very narrow base of support, which was essentially just the Communist Party and other elements of the far left. The MFA forced Prime Minister Vasco Gonçalves to resign. Then a group of anonymous soldiers set up Soldiers United for Victory, SUV, a rank and file organisation aimed at organising soldiers themselves to be able to potentially act independently of the officers. The military brass cracked down and arrested two soldiers for distributing SUV leaflets. This resulted in the biggest demonstration by soldiers in Portuguese history calling for their release. This was potentially a truly revolutionary development as the intent of SUV was to work alongside workers and neighbourhood commissions and constitute a direct counterpower to the state. As SUV wasn't controlled by any particular left group, 
the Communist Party, the MRPP, and a coalition of other Maoist groups all set up their own rank-and-file soldiers' organisations as well. The need for the capitalist state to reassert itself became ever more pressing. One key thing it had to do to regain control, put an end to all the turbulence, and get back to business as usual, was regaining control of the media, which had been largely taken over by the workers after the 25th of April. To illustrate how they did this, this is what happened in the examples of Republica, the newspaper of the Socialist Party, and Radio Renaissance, the Catholic Church's radio station, which were taken over by the workers and discussed in part one. And Republica had lots of ups and downs. I mean, it was eventually, it was eventually banned, and Radio Renaissance, the radio station, was blown up by, by the army um, because they couldn't control it. Shortly after that, there was another final military coup on the 25th of November 1975, where military officers linked to the Socialist Party decided to consolidate their power and end the revolution. My interpretation of the 25th of November is that it is the right-wing military provoked a very small sector of the left military that made a kind of a coup, very small, and all the right-wing and social democrats mobilized with the right-wing and the church, leading by the social democrats to do what is undoubtedly a right-wing coup. After this coup, 130 radical officials of the armed forces and all the soldiers, thousands, under their leadership were arrested, the officials and the soldiers, went out of the army, sent out of the army. So there is no doubt about this. Crucially, the army shut down COPCON, the left-wing faction of the military which left groups like the Communist Party had thought they could use for their own ends. But they hadn't reckoned for the military hierarchy, or at least not until it was too late, as rank-and-file organising within the army was only small in its early stages. Having COPCON do the bidding of the left was all well and good, until the upper echelons of the military hierarchy decided to put a stop to it. And in the absence of widespread self-organisation of the troops, the soldiers and junior officers of COPCON were either expelled or just followed their orders, as they had been trained to do. That was the problem with the Portuguese Revolution, was that the working class forces relied too much on the military. Now, it was the nature of the military, because it came from, uh, came from the working class, uh, it was cons- mainly conscription, so people felt that they were part of the working class as, as well as being part of the military. The actual Communist Party and, and some other left-wing forces, other uh, um, communists, said that the military should be infiltrated. They saw themselves as being able to infiltrate the military and use it for their own benefit. And to some extent, I mean, that that worked out on, that uh, proved true on the 25th of April, uh, 74. But on the other hand, it meant that uh, the working class never developed its own military force. It relied completely on the military. Uh, this was a mistake because once the military was disbanded, I mean, there, there, were no, there was nothing left. There was, there was no uh, defense uh, what's, whatsoever. So people were left isolated. It also put too much emphasis on, on the military in terms of organization. So that this reliance on the army, it worked and made the revolution uh, quite successful in some ways, it was also one of the drawbacks and one, of, and one of the weak points. To clarify, the element of the military which was disbanded, which Phil mentioned just then, was COPCON. Portuguese revolutionaries who wanted to go further than just establishing social democracy also had another serious problem. The problem with Portugal was that it was on its own. I mean, the Portuguese revolution was... was uh, was just isolated. Social Democrats, so they, like the Labour Party, and things, they were all against the revolution. You know, they wanted a parliamentary democracy. They didn't want a revolution. And they were making sure that it was the right of the Socialist Party that, that actually uh, were, were going to win and not the, the communists and uh, anybody else. So the only, the only way out 
of the isolation of Portugal was if Spain, which was in the dying gasps of Francoism, Franco unfortunately didn't die until November 75, and uh, it was a bit too late. He should have died a little bit earlier, and uh, it would have, April 26 would have, been, would have been a good time, yes. But Spain was, I mean, it was just amazing. The, when you go into Spain, all the walls were completely blank. You come into Portugal, and there's murals everywhere and posters and it's it's like a day and night, you know. It's kind of a, you go just go across the border, and it's like a, a, a different a different world. And it was this fear of Spain exploding it was very real in Europe at that time and in the political parties. Now, if that had happened, it would have been a whole different ballgame. Um, unfortunately, it didn't. Working class memory was still focused on the civil war and the bitter memories of the civil war. And people didn't want that to happen again. As luck would have it, General Francisco Franco of Spain would die just after the Portuguese Revolution ended. His hand-picked successor, Luis Carrera Blanco, had recently been assassinated by Basque separatists ETA. His car was blown 20 metres into the air, over a five-storey building, causing him to be dubbed Spain's first astronaut. He was a key figure able to bring together different wings of the Francoist state, and without him and Franco, it began to fall apart and a huge wave of wildcat strikes organised by workers holding mass assemblies broke out. But again, this was too late to link up with events in Portugal. The final military coup of November 1975 wasn't fought against by the bulk of the left, as a deal had been made beforehand. What actually happened was the president, Costa Gomes, who, who is known as the cork, because he always floated above everything, made a deal with the Communist Party and the group of social democrats, this group of nine, in which if there was to be a coup, a right-wing coup, which did happen in November 1975, the Communist Party would not be outlawed. And uh, the Communist Party agreed that they wouldn't come out on the streets if there was a right-wing coup. Something had to give. I think the Communist Party realized that it was either a civil war or making some sort of compromise. And they, they agreed to compromise. So that would be the end of the revolution. We were all as scared uh, it was going to be a kind of a Pinochet deal, but it wasn't, uh, thankfully. It was, uh, it was social democracy. General Augusto Pinochet was the Chilean military officer who led a coup in 1973 against the elected left-wing government of Salvador Allende after which tens of thousands of radical workers and socialists were tortured, murdered and disappeared. And while in retrospect now it seems that a Chilean-style option wasn't really on the cards for a country in Western Europe, that wasn't clear to all of the participants at the time, and Pinochet's coup cast a long shadow over the Portuguese events. After that final coup, there was no energy or momentum amongst the workers to fight on. Yes, I think it's all together. I think it's... Uh... I think people had confidence in them very strongly in the beginning. They, it took, there was a period in, in which, during which this confidence was growing, and that's the period you could say a revolutionary movement is still alive. But so, slowly, the political aspect, all these conflicts, all these intermissions of parties inside of the struggles and inside of the organizations, the, the trying, trying to control the committees, trying to control the rank and file unions, all these struggles, all these bureaucratic struggles became very tiring for people. And when the second military cup arrived in 25, November 25, I think the, the, the reverse was already from from my from my point of view, and it's not only me uh, who think like that. I think the reversal was already done. I mean, people was already very tired, people was already very disappointed, and then in a certain certain level, the the, the strategy of the Communist Party at that at that moment was accepted. The strategy was that we should save what can be saved and uh, negotiate with the new power 
which was behind this second coup, which was basically the capitalist traditional power, I mean, the power of the capitalist class. So we should negotiate a space for us inside of a democratic society. And so I think this idea that was the idea that uh, the leader of the Communist Party, Alvaro Cunhal, defend very brilliant, because he was a brilliant politician, uh, he defend that in a brilliant way. I mean, I think it was accepted by the majority then of the working people because they had lost confidence in themselves and they were tired with all these political struggles inside of the their own organizations. I think it's uh, a lot of organizations that were been, have been created by the working people, the peasants, the students, and the uh, office workers, and so forth, the teachers, and so a lot of, inside of these organizations, there was already, if one can use that ugly word, there was already the counter-revolution, because there was already this, this political perspectives of negotiation for having just a space for functioning in a more democratic society. In terms of the squabbling between political factions in the assemblies and workers and neighbourhood commissions, and the effect that had on the majority of participants, I'm sure that a lot of our listeners would have experienced something similar, albeit to a lesser extent. For example, for anyone who took part in the movement against the Iraq war in the early 2000s, or the Occupy movement a decade later places where mass movements emerge quickly, but many of the forums which originally emerged for discussion and action shrunk and became talking shops for activists in various left-wing political parties. In the end, while the Portuguese revolution didn't usher in socialism or communism, it did result in the disbanding of the bulk of the Portuguese empire. Between 1974 and 75, Guinea-Bissau, Mozambique, Sao Tome and Principe, Angola and East Timor all gained independence although East Timor was then invaded by Indonesia. The only territories Portugal held on to were small islands, including the Azores, Madeira and the Savage Islands. In Portugal itself, the revolution won many new democratic freedoms and civil liberties, as well as significant material improvements in the lives and conditions of working class people. I would say that, of course, we saw the independencies of the colonies and the end of the empire, we saw the building of welfare state, a national health service and universal education system. All, most of the children could not study more than four years and they were obliged to study at least nine years after the revolution in all country. And there was a, a national health service to the entire country called the Periphery Health Service, totally free. We saw a change from income from capital to labor from 18%, one eight, the biggest in all Portuguese history. What that means is, is that the share of national income going to labor, i.e. in workers' wages as opposed to investments and profits, went up by 18 percentage points, which is an incredibly significant increase. We saw all the democratic rights you can imagine, free press, free parties, free meetings, free association, elections, etc. This was all assured. We saw the nationalization of the biggest companies and banks without compensations. Well, literally, the bourgeoisie escaped from Portugal. They went to Brazil during one year with the fraud of the Portuguese. So we are speaking of the last revolution in Europe questioning the private property. Many of these concessions last to this day, but they've all been under attack since the revolution ended. For example, rent controls enacted in Lisbon in response to tenant struggles lasted until 2012, when the government used the financial crisis as an excuse to liberalise them. Many of the self-managed enterprises and cooperatives also continued beyond the end of the revolutionary period. And while these didn't undermine capitalism as such, the experience drastically altered the consciousness of the worker owners. Oh, another side, there is another aspect which I think it's important to underline, is the fact that the people who participate in this experience, they get to develop a consciousness of themselves and of the possibilities to change themselves and the world and the society, which cannot be recuperated. That, that is, for me, 
the only thing in the commons and the cooperatives who cannot be recuperated is this element of social subversive uh, uh, consciousness. And, and that exists for several years in, the, in Portugal, in, in small places, very isolated, but peop, that experience is still in the mind of a lot of people. Between April 1974 and November 1975, Portuguese workers and soldiers transformed not just the country, but perhaps more importantly, they transformed themselves as well. But what we have seen above all, I want to underline this, this is my opinion, it's not just about results, because the counter-revolution slowly ended these results. Slowly. Some of them even still exist today. The most important is that among 10 million people, 3 million were engaged in workers' councils. This is absolutely impressive. People change when they change the country. They, they learn how to live in a different society with solidarity and freedom. And they've changed themselves, changing the country. It's, it's absolutely amazing, this process of transformation. So I think as radical historians, as Marxist historians or as socialist historians, we have to focus not just on results, but on process. The role of possibilities that month where people were own their own lives, show to the world. This is so important, in my opinion. These uh, 18 months were just uh, just awe-inspiring and uh, um, left a lasting impression on me. Amigo, maior que o pensamento. That brings us to the end of this double podcast episode on the Carnation Revolution. For anyone interested in going into a bit more detail, we've got a bonus episode for relevant levels of our Patreon supporters, where we talk about some other aspects of the events which didn't quite fit into these main episodes, like the nature of the new state regime, whether or not it was fascist, uh, different tactics by left groups on deserting the military, and more. You can check that out, link in the show notes. To learn more about the Portuguese Revolution, we highly recommend getting hold of Phil and Raquel's books. A People's History of the Portuguese Revolution by Raquel Varela is a great grassroots overview of the events. And Phil Mailer's Portugal, The Impossible Revolution is an exciting first-person account with a lot of analysis of the actions and strategy of the revolutionary left. You can get them in our online store, link in the show notes, and our patrons can get 20% off these and all other books in the WCH store. If you value our work, please consider supporting us on Patreon to enable us to make this podcast more sustainably and more regular. Go to patreon.com slash workingclasshistory to learn more and sign up, link in the show notes as well. If you can't spare the cash, that is totally fine. Please just give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app and tell your friends about us. On our webpage for this episode, we've got more information, sources, links, photos, and transcripts of these episodes. Link to all that in the show notes as well. Huge thanks to all of our existing Patreon supporters, without whom this podcast would not be possible. The music for these episodes is Traz Ultro Amigo Tamben by Zeca Afonso. Links to stream and purchase that on our website. These episodes were edited by Tyler Hill. Thanks to all of you for listening, and catch you next time.